This week on Vaticano, Pope Francis is back from Lenten spiritual exercises. In his March prayer petition, the Holy Father invites the Church to pray for Christians who are being persecuted. We introduce you to a former atheist poet, and you'll discover her journey from atheism to Catholicism. Stay with us to learn more about the celebration of International Women's Day at the Vatican. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. On the second Sunday of Lent, March the 12th, Pope Francis explained the mystery of Jesus' transfiguration. La luminosità. The luminosity that characterized this extraordinary event symbolized the purpose, to illumine the minds and hearts of the disciples so that they could understand clearly who their master was. It was a flash of light that opened suddenly on the mystery of Jesus and illumined his whole person and his whole story. E tutta la sua vicenda. The Holy Father said that through Jesus' transfiguration, he wanted to confirm the faith of his disciples and prepare them for his death on the cross. Those who die with Christ will rise with Christ. And the cross is the door of the resurrection. Those who fight with him will triumph with him. This is the message of hope contained in Christ's cross, exhorting to fortitude in our existence. Pope Francis invited all the faithful to contemplate the crucified Jesus as the symbol of the Christian faith. This Lenten journey is a good time to better understand the gravity of sin and the value of the sacrifice with which the Redeemer saved us all. On Sunday afternoon, the Holy Father visited the parish of St. Magdalene of Canossa in the northeast of Rome. A conversation with children and young people of the parish kicked off the visit, after which the Pope greeted the elderly and the sick. In this passage from the Gospel, there are two references to the beauty of Jesus. Of Jesus as God, of Jesus the light, of Jesus full of joy and life. In his homily, Pope Francis spoke about the two different faces of Jesus, the beautiful and glorified face, and on the other hand, the suffering, disfigured face. And may this contemplation of the two faces of Jesus, the disfigured and the tortured and despised, encourage us to continue on this, our journey of life, on our journey of Christian life. May it encourage us to ask forgiveness for our sins and not to sin so much. Pope Francis said that with the confidence of the Transfiguration, we should go forward on our Lenten journey, seeing the brilliant face of Jesus, which will shine as much as at the Resurrection. And in his March prayer petition, Pope Francis invites the whole Church to remember in their prayers the persecuted Christians. Les hago una pregunta. ¿Cuántos de ustedes rezan por los cristianos que son perseguidos? Anímense a hacerlo conmigo para que experimenten el apoyo de todas las iglesias y comunidades por medio de la oración y de la ayuda material. Sixteen miles southeast of Rome, in a place called the Alban Hills, lies the city of Aricia. In 2014, Aricia became even more famous when the Roman Curia chose it as the spot to hold their Lenten spiritual exercises. Father Olinto Crespi is one of the five Pauline Fathers that manage the Divine Master Retreat House. He was a novice when Father Alberione built this spiritual complex. 
Father Olinto would never have imagined that one day this simple house would become a spiritual center for the Vatican's Curia. Una piccola cittadella del Vaticano. Yes, this town becomes a little Vatican city in a way, and all of us in the community change our lives accordingly. We are all new, so this is our first experience with the Pope. We know that the Pope doesn't get around much. Bedroom, chapel, dining room. He speaks very little even while eating. There's always music in the background, and we must be silent. Real spiritual exercises in the style of St. Ignatius. This year, the Lenten meditations were centered on the theme of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, according to the Gospel of Matthew. The spiritual exercises were guided by the Franciscan father, Giulio Michelini. We start with Mass, and then we have breakfast, and then again we go to the chapel for meditation. We go back to the chapel again after lunch. And while many other groups gather in the auditorium, the Pope wants to be alone in the chapel. And this says a lot about the atmosphere Pope Francis wants to create. We must keep silent, too. I mean, we kind of have to disappear. The last day of this five-day retreat of spiritual exercises ended with a Mass offered for Syria. In addition to their prayers, the members of the Roman Curia raised 100,000 euros for the city of Aleppo. The Roman Curia arrived back in the Vatican around 11.30 in the morning on March the 10th. In a few moments, we'll introduce you to a former atheist poet and her journey from atheism to Catholicism. Now on Vaticano, an exclusive interview by Monsignor Anthony Figueredo with poet Sally Reed about her recent book, Night's Bright Darkness. Sally, this amazing, deep, yet lightning conversion story, amazing, truly, night's bright darkness. What was that night for you? Well, the night in the book really speaks of the conversion and, um, if you like, the kind of St. John of the Cross, Via Negativa, which was how I first perceived God to be. But it also talks about a night back in my past, in my early 20s, when I was a psychiatric nurse living in London, and I was nursing patients who many times were Holocaust survivors who'd come to London as children. So as a young woman who was an atheist, so I had no faith to cling to, um, that work was extremely demanding, very, very rewarding, but nevertheless quite frazzling. Um, and at the same time, I was involved in the London dating scene, which is so common, and I was involved in a, in a very, very difficult relationship with a man who did not want to commit to me which is a common thing. So God was really using all this suffering. Looking back on it, would you say that would be true? I do. I think that's very true. And I think I, I write in the book that at one point I sat on the floor and I, I was in a terrible state and I said aloud, I'm in hell. And, and I almost, I thought to myself, if I believed in God, this would be so much easier. But I couldn't believe in God because I'd been brought up very much to believe that religion was stupid. I God's thought, grace did touch you then. Uh, he came into your life at a very specific moment. Yes, exactly. I mean, it was years and years later that I did realise that there was a God, um, sort of 12 years later, where I was, by that point, married. I was a published poet and had left, in a sense, that suffering behind me. Um, but when I, when I realised that there was a God in the March of 2010, which was when the, the first experience happened with, with realising that there was God, um, I looked back to that black time in London and it seemed that the two points in time seemed to be united. The absence of God or the seeming absence of God with this sudden presence that was so, so incredibly striking. Some of the mystics talk about this, you know, I think of St. Augustine and he says, you know, I, your light shone through. You, you broke through my deafness, through my darkness. That brightness shone through. Was it a specific moment? Yes, it was three specific moments, actually. It was in the spring of 2010, um, and I, I didn't realise until I looked back on those moments, because 
I had no concept of the Trinity, I had no concept of God, but the three experiences were of the Father, where I realised that there was a God, but I had no idea what that God was, whether it was a Christian God or a God of Islam or whether it was a good God. A couple of weeks later, I had an incredible experience where one night when I couldn't sleep, the spirit came to me and it was a physical experience. That the, physical? Absolutely. It was could, as if... Could you describe that? That's amazing. I was... I wasn't sleeping and I'd gone downstairs to read and I read something by T.S. Eliot, which I think is important in a sense. And when I went back upstairs to bed, I, I lay down and I was so rigid. I, it's so hard to describe, but when your world is turned upside down by realising that there is a God, it's very discommoding. I was very, very tense and all of a sudden I felt this kind of presence wash through me physically and the tears just rolled down my cheeks and I felt this incredible surrender that I could not understand. So the Father, the Spirit, and there's that third moment. There, I have to say there was no peace until one day, a week after that, I went into a church and I was just wondering and still upset and was crying again and I looked up at this icon of Christ and I said aloud, if you're there you have to help me. And at that point I felt Christ's presence literally come down and my tears dried and my face relaxed and I felt as though I'd had amnesia and someone walked into the room that I knew and it was as if my life had been given back to me. It was incredible. What about today, you, if you've had that deep conversion experience but you've come from a lot of darkness, Sally, is living your faith today a struggle, a battle? No, <laughs> it's not because I've lived the opposite, you know, and um, my faith is, is an immense source of strength. It really is. I, I, I love going to Mass and I, and I love the sacraments and without them I just, I just couldn't live my life. I know what it's like to struggle on without God and even when we're suffering, I know that suffering is ten times easier with God than without. And the prayer as well, I think you've really grown in your prayer life in this time. I pray the whole day and um, adoration is incredibly important for me as well. The end of the book, I talk about um, adoration uh, with the nuns um, who live nearby and the Eucharist is, is, for me, the source of all consolation and the source of all truth. I, I, um, I couldn't go a day without visiting the Blessed Sacrament. So there was one thing you had to say, Sally, to someone in your situation today, where you were, what would that be to give them courage, hope? I would say that God has a plan for everybody. And I would say that you just have to let God have a second of your consent and a second of your time and he will intervene. And even if things seem absolutely rock bottom and absolutely hopeless, God is there and he knows the time to lead you to him. Today you're obviously very grateful, you're thankful to the Lord and you become a sign to others. I hope so. That's, that's really, I, I pondered about whether to write this book because the experiences were so dramatic and they were so intense that I really prayed about whether to write it. And it's become abundantly clear now having written it that those signs weren't just for me, they were for other people too. My own spiritual life just this morning on Mary Magdalene and uh, her conversion experience. And once she had met the Lord, touched his mercy, touched his love, his goodness, she could never leave him. And it was really like his real presence. And so she's really seen as a mother of the Eucharist. Yeah. In fact, I took the name Mary Magdalene when I, when I entered the church because, because of that, because she clung to him so much. And exactly, I think that when, when he uh, you know, resurrected and she was there and he said, you know, don't cling on to me, she was the first one to experience the hunger for the Eucharist. And she became that great uh, evangelizer then, the apostle to the apostles. Isn't that amazing? A woman and you two becoming an apostle to many others too. Thanks so much, Sally. Thanks for having me. The persecution of Christians in the world has reached truly alarming proportions. We have seen unimaginable violence carried out in the name of religion. Acts of wanton slaughter against religious minorities, horrors on a scale that defy description. Terrorism is a fundamental threat to religious freedom. It must be stopped and it will be stopped. Mutual respect and peaceful coexistence as a condition of interreligious peace and stability was the theme of this high-level conference on March 7th at the UN in Geneva on the sidelines of the 34th session of the UN Human Rights Council. Persecutions of this kind strike regularly somewhere in the world 
and being martyred for Christ is a permanent aspect of Christian life. To give hope to this uh, difficult situation of the Christians uh, of uh, the Middle East. Without a decision of the Iraqi government or the international community to protect the Christian community, certainly the flow of Christians who are leaving the country will continue. If you have a look the conference was organized by eight countries, including Russia, the Vatican and Hungary. Or even UN documents, or documents of any other international organizations. I can, I can offer a bet, because I know the EU conclusions. You will hardly find the expression, protection of Christians. What you will find? Protection of uh, minorities, protection of various groups, maybe sometimes protection of religious groups but you will never find protection of Christians. This conference is important for me as Muslim, as we understand that today's world is like a pipeline system. Everything is connected. So if we don't protect our Christian brothers in Syria, for example, and in other places, it will have also an impact on Muslims. As the Apostle John is tracked, you cannot love God if you do not have love towards your brother. For this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God, loves his brother also. During the conference it was often referred to the joint statement signed last year in Havana by the Patriarch of Moscow and all Russia, Kirill and Pope Francis, calling on the international community to take immediate action to stop the mass exodus of Christians from Middle Eastern countries. My own view is that um, when we talk about fanaticism, when we talk about uh, religious fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism, uh, one phenomenon which I tried to draw attention to is the role played by secularism, by aggressive militant secularism, in creating the conditions, particularly in Europe. The permanent observer of the Holy See to the United Nations in Geneva called on participants to recognize religious freedom as a fundamental human right. The tendency towards globalization is good. It can be noble, but if, if it pretends to make us all the same, it destroys the uniqueness of each people and each person. We live in a world subject to the globalization of the technocratic paradigm, which consciously aims at a one-dimensional uniformity and seeks to eliminate all differences and traditions in a superficial quest for the unity. This is a very complex thing, you know, which happened everywhere, probably in the other continents also. You see so-called, they say, called liberal society, but the liberal society is not a problem. No, freedom is freedom, you know. The problem is just how to define the role of religion and whether you, being a religious, sh should have the same visibility in the public life as the others. All the panelists agreed that the knowledge about the Christian religion, as well as learning the basics of other religious doctrines, can save many people from falling into the trap of extremist ideology. Thanks for watching. Stick around for more on Vaticano. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. March 8th is known worldwide as International Women's Day. Despite the controversial issues connected with the celebration of this event, Women's Day was marked at the Vatican with a conference. The second edition of Voices of Faith gathered participants from around the world to share and hear the stories of women who work for an effective and transparent church, social justice, human rights and peace. The event took place at the Casina Pio Quarto, the headquarters of the Pontifical Academy for Sciences in the Vatican. For Andrea Hattler Bramson, a member of the advisory board of Voices of Faith, the aim of this gathering is to highlight the role of women in the church and create a network for mutual support. 
It's a very small initiative, actually, that is clearly growing very rapidly, for which we're very grateful. Uh, started in 2014, was the first time we had an event, but we really started kind of talking about it in 2013. Uh, and we started talking about uh, highlighting the role of women in the church more and more as a result of uh, some of John Paul II's uh, comments, as opposed, and, and certainly as a result of Pope Francis's comments. Uh, the intent is uh, the organization should continue to evolve and collaborate and continue to be a stronger place for women to find uh, supporting and, and, and support and endorsement. Dr. Muriel Twayagira was among several speakers at the 2017 edition of the gathering. Her story deeply moved all listeners. Only 25 years old, Muriel has endured war, the deprivations of being a refugee, and the death of her siblings, but also lived the personal triumph of getting a government scholarship to study abroad. So for me, this is a very important uh, moment because people can get to hear my story and not just feel sorry for me, but also see ways they can help other people like me, like get a better education or get a safe place, uh, you know, open their homes to refugees like me. And also for girls, young girls who are going through tough situations, who are maybe listening to, to, uh, to Voices of Faith, that they can they see a hope, that they see that it's all possible. So it's very important for me. In her testimony, Muriel pointed out that when war broke out in her native Burundi, she was only three years old. The war took her father's life, and as a consequence, the family decided to flee the country. That moment marked the beginning of Muriel's arduous journey. For six years, she managed to survive in the forests of Rwanda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Zambia, and Angola, before reaching the Zaleka refugee camp in Malawi. During this deadly journey, Muriel lost her sister, her mother, and her grandparents. But these hardships could not take away the hope from her heart and the smile from her face. In 2009, I sat for a national examination, and I was among the top six students in the whole country. So um, there was an award ceremony, the award best girls in the country, a radio station. So um, during that ceremony, we were awarded uh, scholarships. Yeah. But then there I was, I didn't have any citizenship, no passport, so I was among the, the three girls, because we were three girls and three boys, so I'm, I was among the three girls. So many people asked me themselves, how is she going to go? Even myself, I was like, okay, how is this going to happen? But people fought for me, really, and I, they gave me citizenship, but the head of state himself, so I was able to go to China to study medicine, yeah in Chinese language. Father David Holdcroft is the Jesuit Refugee Service Regional Director for Southern Africa. He heard Muriel's story from the people at the refugee camp in Malawi and decided to get to know this brave woman personally. And then Marie went back to camp and she was staying with an uncle, I believe, and a family who had been very good to her in camp, as happens in refugee camps. And, uh, and she said, and what, what really impressed me about her was that she said, well, you know, I'm staying in camp, I'm waiting to get an internship, so where else would I stay? And then she talked about Malawi and she said, well, no, they did the right thing by me, so I'm going to contribute to the development of this country. And, and that's sort of, that's the kind of spirit and the kind of selflessness that, that I find personally really inspiring. And I believe that once a girl is educated, that means you're educating the whole family actually. Because a woman, you raise your children, they are with you all the time. You know, whatever they get is what you, what you teach them. So if a woman is educated, that means the whole family, will, you know, they will get quality uh, advice from, them, from their mothers. So educating a girl is actually educating the whole country. So it is very important that people have food on the table, um, but it's also, it's just as important that people have choice when they're building their lives. And, um, and I think this is the sort of work, it's peace building, um, because people often start wars when they think there is no alternative. But if we are trained to think, to read, to open our horizons, and to meet people as they are, and to listen to them, then, then that's the way that we build peace in our world. And, and I think many of the African countries, despite all the problems, can actually teach us a lot about this. 
They know migrants and at a level they accept migrants and they know that is part of human endeavour. We think, oh, it's terrible, it's the most refugees there's ever been. Perhaps in numbers, yes, but proportion to the human population? No, we've been moving all, all the time. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm the, the son of migrants um, to my native Australia. And, and this is kind of normal human endeavour, and we need to find ways to be open to them, to find in ourselves the capacity to welcome these people. The powerful stories shared during Voices of Faith are telling examples of women's faith in action. On the symbolic day of the 8th of March, women's voices are heard from the heart of the Catholic Church. Well, my faith definitely played a very big role in my life. Well, uh, before I went to China, of course, I was very little, so I didn't. I went to church and everything, but I didn't really know. I didn't. I hadn't encountered God for myself. But then, when I went to China, that's where I actually found purpose. So my faith actually helped me to find purpose, even though I had gone through a lot in life. But I got to realize, okay, I, I've gone through that, but that's not it. I have a purpose in life. So I would say it's, it's played a very big role because I found myself. I found purpose.